Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 833. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is December 8th, 2023. All right, thank you for joining us for another episode of Anglican Unscripted. Before we get too far, this is my opportunity to beg you to please like the show. Just like it on YouTube and Facebook. It's free advertising. It works with algorithms way beyond our control and understanding in the whole world of AI and promotes these two little Anglicans amongst the... (laughs) The, the brute world of, of uh, uh, online information. So we appreciate that very much. Uh, if you have not shared this program with your friends or foes in recent times, it's time to do that. But most importantly, the most important thing you can do is to go to the comment sections of each show and, and give us your opinion. Tell us what you think about the topics we're talking about. If there is a slight correction, you're welcome to correct it. If you have other story ideas or leads, put them there. Or you can send an email to us. You can find that also in the show notes. Oh, what a deep breath. George, how are you doing this week? Tired this week. A lot oh. going on. Doctor's appointments, doctor's visits, church mm-hmm. uh, season picking up faster and faster and faster. Right. So here it is Saturday. The office is closed. So I didn't even just bother getting dressed. I uh, <laughs> you don't even, uh, you don't even in know my what... civilian clothes. <laughs> you don't even know what day it is. It's Friday. Today's Friday. What did, what did I say? What? You said Saturday. It's not a big deal. Okay. Uh, I've had a bad week as well. Um, I had a root canal to start my week off on Monday. And then on Tuesday, I followed that up with a sinus infection. And uh, so we decided not to tape at all on Tuesday, which is good. So I could rest up. So I would feel so much better on Friday. And I still feel kind of blah. It's, I'm on antibiotics. And, you know, they, they, they're they not pep pills, George. This is this is a blah we're trying to heal you pills but that's what's going on with us um let's move on here to the news we got a lot a lot to cover here today i noticed that in our story notes we have t- uh, 11 different story notes we did not announce that the acna is having provincial synod on their 15th anniversary george yeah in uh latrobe pennsylvania i think mm-hmm. st vincent's college yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. we were there uh all those years ago, uh, gosh, Kevin, I hate that sound like an old fart, but uh, there we are. We were there for uh, the conclave of the election of Archbishop Foley Beach to be mm-hmm. uh, the replacement for Archbishop Fo- uh, uh, Bishop Duncan, and it, it was it's a lot of fun. It's a neat. And we were there campus. 15 years ago in Fort Fort Worth, mm-hmm. and uh, and we were at the last one at Latrobe, Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, all I remember about Latrobe, Pennsylvania, is Arnold Palmer's golf course. But apart from that, I'm sure it'll be fun. Uh, I remember the little trolley they had that honored uh, um, oh, the guy who was a uh, da da had a little TV show for kids. Mister Rogers. Mister Rogers. People are like Kevin. You should have known that. No, I'm on antibiotics. Don't that could that that's a fleeting thought. Didn't need to know that at all. So, Mister Rogers, I mean, Latrobe's an amazing place. Pennsylvania's an amazing place. So, uh, if you get the invitation and you get the chance to go, please go. Uh, George and I will be making arrangements. One of us or both of us will go, depending on our travels. And so, we're not going to raise money this week, but you'll find fundraising uh, announcements as we go on. Uh, George, let's move on to the news and talk about what's going on out there. And my story list is over here. Oh, you posted a story on Anglican Inc. that's going to get a lot of viewership and readership. And it talks about one of my favorite topics, uh, which is artificial intelligence. Jordan Peterson, uh, a great uh, counselor, uh, professor, and uh, you know, right now a man about society, has written about AI and he thinks it's evil demonic and he's written we, an, yeah he's written a new book and he's excerpt uh, excerpted a section that uh, he shared with elon musk and elon musk put it out and we put it out as well and the the theory is ai is the gateway to the demonic demonic and this is not uh hyperbole in uh, his his uh thoughts he has been doing some work with uh, chat gpt 
and he find and asking specific questions and seeing how the answers come out and running it at different simulations and it is atheistic it's the languages and the answers mm. given the algorithms <clears throat> have been programmed in such a way as to diminish uh, the Christian worldview and replace it with the woke worldview. In the article that, in the excerpt we printed, he gave the example of a, uh, you know, give us, an, give me in a thousand words a traditional myth story about the meaning of life. And Chat GPT came out with a female character with different uh, goals, different aims, different views than to the traditional hero story, which is a male overcoming uh, adversity mm -hmm. and uh, seeking virtue. Uh, you know, going back from uh, the King Arthur stories to anything that you can think of along this line. But ChatGPT, and then uh, he qu questioned ChatGPT, why did you change the gender of the hero? And it came back uh, with the woke gobbledygook nonsense. And uh, Peterson's point is that humans are lazy. And if we begin to rely on things like AI for, for our thinking, for our actions. And there is a specific agenda underlying that. We are going to basically be destroying the basis of our culture, which is the Christian Western worldview and replacing it with the woke Marxist worldview. But that's happening regardless of AI right now. If you look at any of the Disney characters of the last 15 years, they're all female. Uh, if you look at uh, heroines, I should say, if you mm -hmm. look at any of the TV shows right now on TV, name for me one TV show that has a father who is gainfully employed, has uh, obedient children and a housewife. Something popular in the 70s and 60s does not exist anymore because that's something to be mocked. Uh, a, a show now uh, that would be popular is the Married with Children type show. Uh, the Murphy Brown type shows that they kind of mock the standard uh, nuclear the family and they would rather mock it than promote it and those same type of programmers now <laughs> i would say disney programmers have taken over the the ais now artificial intelligence in of itself is benign it's what you put into it the the, the good data or bad data and here we're putting in the bad data where we say all things being equal uh a equals b equals c and that's not how the world was created. The, the world was not created to be that way, George. I've heard the phrase, a crisis of competency, being thrown around about the state of our culture and our country today. Mm -hmm. uh, Greta Van Susteren, who used to be on CNN and now is on another network, I'm not sure which, yeah. uh, said that the three <clears throat> college professors, president, president Claudine Gay of Harvard, Liz McGill of uh, Penn, and I forget the woman from MIT, their performance in front of Congress has set the women's movement back 50 years because it was so self-evident that these were affirmative action hires. That they were not competent mm -hmm. to be presidents of prestigious major universities. And instead, you know, uh, killing Jews, calling for, the, for genocide against Jews, as one of the professors said, had to be seen in context what you know which context is it permissible to kill jews just because they're jews well now I, of course two of the three have since backed down but what put these three women in their jobs was not their competency mm -hmm. but the color of their skin and their chromosomes not that they could advance the interests of the university of pennsylvania or harvard or mit now, we need to stop here because people are, are, what are you guys saying? We are saying that women are can be extremely competent CEOs, deans, you know, that's not what we're not, what we're saying here is the pendulum has gone so far anti-man that you don't even hear about men in society anymore. And this is especially true in AI. When I played with AI when it first came out, I was kind of shocked by how woke it was. Every answer would have the real answer, but at the the, the bottom, it would be a separate paragraph. It would say, however, comma, and it would explain the wokeness that's not in the first paragraph. And we can't be in this, this dual world where 
the whole world is against men, including the Pope. Well, I just happened to notice I saw an ad for CNN's new news lineup from 7 to 11, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> there's not a single straight white male amongst them. There's only one male, and that's Anderson Cooper, and he is not a straight man, far from it. And the rest are women, and the majority of them are uh, women of color, as they say. And in other words, the pendulum has swung so far that competency really has nothing to do with the hiring decisions these days. Um, the pushback is coming, though. Uh, we're seeing it in these major prestigious universities where billionaires, alumni of these com of companies, who uh, one fellow who had promised $100 million to Penn has just said, forget about it. Uh, you know, I'm not doing it because of uh, I'm so embarrassed by the worldview being put forward by Penn. Or, uh, or uh, another person was going to give a C equal sum to MIT, but uh, they're all being booked. So maybe money is going to cause a rethink. Uh, just like Anheuser-Busch had, well, they've not, you know, look at Target and look at Disney. They've taken a hammering in the stock markets, I believe. Mm -hmm. You know better than I, Kevin. Well, but they're it, still pursuing the woke agenda in their marketing and in their worldviews. Because, well, Target and Disney are looking at the long picture. They they believe society will eventually follow them. And so when they throw the, the pendulum one way, they're waiting for time for society to catch up to them. Uh, Disney wants to lead society in how it characterizes men and women and how it characterizes LGBT in, in, the, in the queer community. Uh, target the same way. We're going to have gender-free bathrooms uh, and we don't care about the safety of our customers. Eventually, you won't care either. And that's that, that long game they play. And in my basic reading of history, Satan has a much better uh, long game than the Christians do. You know, we, we seem to, to freak out instead of press forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My opinion now on the same topic pope francis at a conference has told the roman catholic church that it is too masculine george uh, francis had a meeting before a, a commission at the vatican and he came across with a good old francis line which basically sets everything on its head and backwards and Francis said is that the Catholic Church is too masculine. We need to make it more feminine. We need to feminize it. Well, Francis has got it absolutely completely backwards. A few years ago, a fellow named Leon Poodles, 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 P-O-D-L-E-S, P -O -D -L -E -S, yeah. wrote a book. Uh, let me just, I had its title here. What was it called? It was called The Church Impotent, The Feminization of Christianity, where Poodles, Poodles uh, documents the how traditional ma masculine worldviews and virtues are now seen as incompatible with Christianity. And in the parish, I know this to be true. And in the world around us, I know this to be true. And the Episcopal Church is just as bad, if not worse in this. I mean, uh, going back to Frank Griswold, the least masculine man I've ever met, but the... Uh, destruction of traditional male virtues and male worldviews in the pursuit of uh, feminine uh, worldviews has made men almost into a different religion so that we're in a world where I'll say kooks like Andrew Tate can arise because what they're the masculine virtues that they seem to be teaching are being rejected by the leaders of our churches mm -hmm. and now, i'm sorry that's just not going to fly well somehow the in this happened like the mid 70s uh, early 80s somebody introduced a term that hasn't gone away yet and that term is called toxic uh, masculinity mm -hmm. now it's not applied to femininity i've never heard somebody say toxic femininity but w they've tried to to ruin the image of what it means to be a man and then they tried to redefine what it means to be a man. And being a man now means uh, stuff that is abhorrent to, to the characterization of who men really are and who men are created to be uh, under the Godhead. And once you start doing that, it's all over, George. 
do you remember a few years ago when Obama was pushing his Obamacare? They had a commercial with what they call Pajama Boy. Pajama uh, Boy. <laughs> where this 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 rather <laughs> fruity tooty fellow was uh you know looking uh you know searching the internet yeah. searching the internet with a coffee cup in his pajamas. And this picture was emblematic of the Obama government worldview of men and masculinity. Mm -hmm. And that has moved wholeheartedly into the church culture. Church culture may have pre uh, predated it, of course, but to me, that was a point where like we could actually see where the government is pressing this. And, you know, part of the difficulty I have with the Episcopal Church, among many things, is that there's so very few masculine men in the ministry, entering mm -hmm. the ministry these days. It's becoming a woman's profession, like being a kindergarten teacher. It's full of Starbucks barista men uh, who are you know, trying to uh, find a job of some sort. I, I, I have to agree. I, um, we have decided that the default for bringing forth the next generation is going to be feminine and uh the, anything masculine needs to be put away and because of some bad feelings some people have about masculinity from uh years gone by we're going to completely erase it and we're gonna we're gonna make uh sex and gender neutral mm -hmm. Okay, and they're doing a great job. I mean, the universities are a great example of this uh, new uh, gender-neutral think. And, you know, the, to hear the stuff that comes out of there is just ridiculous. But, well, the, Central Florida, you know, under John Howe, was a, he gave off a very masculine worldview, sure. very masculine approach mm -hmm. to things. His successor was the opposite and either appointed almost all women to his staff or men like Kennedy the, the Ordinary who were very feminine. Well, fortunately, we've elected a new bishop who's more in the how mode of being a man's man. And I know there are going to be some people who get their back up when I talk like this. But well, frankly, I'll, put you, I'll put your email under here for people to see it. Yeah, quite. <laughs> you know, but, but, but frankly, the, uh, the ability to... You know, all the studies have shown that you know, when you have the father attending church, I think like 80% of the, you know, 80% of the time it's passed on to the children. If the mm -hmm. father is absent from the Christian faith, then that falls to a very, almost an opposite level. I don't remember the exact numbers, but this has, you know, been shown in studies in the UK and the US and in Europe, that the role that men play in the passing on of Christian life and morals and doctrine is absolutely necessary for the transmission of faith to the new, next generations. And we are engaged in a program that marginalizes and pushes men away. Um, uh, hey, hold on. Your, your thoughts are very short here, George. We've gone, the society has gone way beyond that. They mean it so that having a family is undesirable. It's not that they, they wiped out what a man is and what a woman is. Uh, 30-year-olds and 20-year-olds and some 40-year-olds aren't having kids anymore. My kids don't have kids and they don't want to have kids uh, because it, it will interfere with their lifestyle and what they're trying to achieve and have goals. And so we have here in America and most of the West wiped out the nuclear family in a single generation. Nobody wants to have children anymore because we've redefined what it means to be a man, we've redefined what it means to be a woman, and we've redefined what it means to be a mother and a father. And, you know, I can take the, this, this, the title of the first story and apply it to this one. Mm -hmm. uh, the feminization of the church is demonic. AI is the gateway to demonic. <laughs> A lot of demons in today. Yeah, show, so many demons. <laughs> Indeed. All right, let's uh, let's keep moving on here. We're, we're getting down, and we're going to run into some time constraints if we can get all eleven stories in here. Church of England needs alternative Episcopal oversight. I've been saying this for years, George. It's not like this is news. Back in the days of Rowan Williams, I said, you know, they could use a little depot, little depot, George. 
Yeah, the Church of England Evangelical Council has been putting forward suggestions as to the way forward through the impasse over living uh, love and faith prayers. And essentially their point is that we need a temporary uh, alternative Episcopal oversight uh, so that those who cannot in good conscience be part of uh, a di be, uh, serve under a bishop who teaches a doctrine that they believe is incompatible with scripture can continue in the Church of England because uh, we've reached that point. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem is, and the <clears throat> Church of England Evangelical Council and Martin Davey, uh, who is a, used to be a theological advisor to the House of Bishops, has put out an article on Anglican Inc., which is, states the same thing. Problem is, the bishops don't want this. They do not want to give away or give up their authority. And the, and the second problem is, even if they do, all you need is one bad bishop to screw up the whole thing. 30 years ago in the Diocese of Pennsylvania, where I started off, uh, we had depot where the Anglo-Catholic parishes had uh, the Bishop of Springfield come in, I'm sorry, the Bishop of Quincy, Quincy yeah. come in and uh, with the agreement of the bishop do Episcopal oversight for the Anglo-Catholic Ford and Faith parishes. Well, all you needed was one bad bishop and his name was Charles Benison to screw that up and to break promises and the whole thing fell apart. And so that Depot is based upon the goodwill and good character of all involved. And as we have seen, that cannot be guaranteed. So the long-term solution the Church of England Evangelical Council is saying is that we need a third province, which is two provinces, Canterbury and York. Now we need a third one with its own uh, laws, its own appointment system, its own bishops, its own seminary training, its own clergy selection uh, in order to keep the Church of England together. Essentially what they're asking for is a Episcopal Church slash ACNA solution without the lawsuits, but with recognition of each other. <clears throat> I can't see that happening in the short run. Um, because people in power don't want to give up authority. Yeah, they don't. In fact, I think there was a big disappointment that they had flying bishops back when they started with women's orders in the Church of England, because they could have quickly squashed out mutual flourishing in the first couple weeks, if not uh, years, instead of having to put up with their little mutual flourishing uh, services for almost a, a decade and a half, George. If they could just not have those depots, if they could just have no such thing as alternative oversight or flying bishops. And that's why they're now trying to retain their power. It didn't work before. It, it, it thwarted our, our quick uh, overtaking of the, the Church of England. And it's also moving against the trajectory that Justin Welby has placed the Church of England on, which is over-centralization, where every decision is made uh, by the blob in London at Church House, an unelected, unaccountable bureaucracy um, basically running the show, running the appointments process, running the distribution of assets, uh, preference. That centralization runs counter to the whole ethos of uh, a third province or delegated Episcopal oversight. So I just can't see it happening with the current people at the top of the pile. So help me out here, okay? A lot of people complain about the Church of England. How bad could it be? It's not like they're having raves in their naves, George. You know, it can't well, be. Well, <laughs> oh, no. I'm afraid they're having raves in the nave. <laughs> Most popular article of the week on Anglican Inc. was Gavin Ashington's title, Raves in the Nave. You know, we've reported in the past how Canterbury Cathedral had a... Uh, we call it a slide. The English have another thing for it. Uh, for it. Yeah, I forget what it's called. Uh, uh, where it's one of these sort of twirly things that you slide down. They and another uh, cathedral had a mini golf or put, you know, miniature golf. And mm -hmm. these are things. And some cathedrals have these Gaia balls or statues, and and some it's all some shoot a, music videos for MTV. You know, yeah. yeah. Or, you know, <clears throat> Harry Potter films yeah. and things like that. It's all to raise money. And the argument is, well, if we just get people into the building, maybe that'll make them come on Sunday morning. 
It has never worked. Work. And, you know, the Episcopal Church, St. John the Divine Cathedral in New York City, once rented out its church to Elton John for his birthday party, and Elton John stood on the altar to sing, for goodness sakes. They made a little podium. But secularizing cathedrals is a trend. Um, some of them we've uh, ridiculed, like the one cathedral that is now selling its own brand of gin, which may not be such a good idea. You know, That's, you know, know. <clears throat> now Canterbury Cathedral, its new dean, has decided to host a rave, which is one of these techno parties with the pulsating lights and beats, <laughs> things like that. And, you know, of course, there will be people taking uh, drugs and poppers and this and that. That's how raves last on ecstasy and things like that. And Gavin's point is, Gavin had an excellent article then the last paragraph or so said well just give it back to the catholic church and well that the, won't solve the problem at least in the united states the catholic church is the just as bad as the yeah. episcopal church yeah, the masculine catholic church yes. but, but the issue the the issue is that canterbury cathedral is now a rather cheesy music venue mm -hmm. um for pimply teenagers and drug addicted uh, 20 year olds for people who've not experienced enough debauchery in their culture you can come to the nave and we will show you better debauchery absolutely you know and, and you know you go to any english town town uh town center on uh yeah. saturday nights and the uh uh vomit and islamic extremists now seem to be the two things that you find at midnight in town centers mm -hmm. and let's just import that into the cathedrals as well you know there is there is some truth into the notion of sacred spaces, not because the spaces in and of themselves are sacred, but rather because that is where we people come to connect with each other and with God in the worship of our risen Lord. And to turn that into a disco, into a rave, into a nightclub, oh, well, I'll say it's disappointing, disappointing. and short-sighted. <laughs> very short-sighted and very reactionary. Uh, that is not the, the design of the church that Jesus created. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not the desire of the church that Jesus created. It's not the foundation and the cornerstone of the church created. The, the church created is there to transform society, lives, and put people on a, a certain trajectory towards heaven. And you, 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 you're not going to do it by putting a little mirrored ball up, some fog lights, which churches do now anyway, and, and, and get a thumping music on. It, it, it ain't going to happen. I know because I'm, I'm a, a former DJ. George, let's move on and talk about some more stuff. Uh, the Scottish Episcopal Church has released a parish to Gafcon. The, what? Not the Scottish. <laughs> West Hill Community Church and the Diocese of Aberdeen and Orkney put out a joint press release on Monday of this week saying that the diocese had agreed to release the parish to the Anglican Convocation in Europe. Now, uh, I believe David McCarthy, who has been a Scottish leader of the GAFCON movement, is now going is scheduled to start in January, I think, as their mm -hmm. new rector. This is a very encouraging sign. Little history. Aberdeen and Orkney is the place with the bad woman bishop. Uh, it was what had been the conservative Scottish diocese that didn't want women bishop, didn't want gay, the gay stuff. And, of course, when they had a vacancy, what did the Scottish bishops do? They put in a woman bishop who uh, was a, a pro-gay activist. Well, she is the one who has been suspended because of bullying and misconduct. And they've had uh, other bishops. And at this time, the current acting bishop is Dorsey McConnell, the retired bishop of Pittsburgh or the Episcopal Church. And they've agreed to allow this parish, which is the largest parish in terms of attendance, to leave. It's as the Truro or the uh, uh, Falls Church type thing in Virginia. Leave, but take their property with them. 
Now, West Hill Community, West Hill Community Church is a newer, newer construction. It's not an ancient building, so that issue doesn't arise. But it is heartening to see the Scots settle this without litigation, without acrimony, and blessings on each side. Yeah, we'll see what happens there. Let's uh, stick over in Europe and talk about Christian Climate Action. They're a group that likes to uh, glue themselves to oil trucks, sidewalks, and and uh, pedestrian walks to keep people informed about the horrors of climate change. Uh, they have been uh, disrupting church services, and it's done enough to make the news, George. Yeah, last show we uh, reported that Christian Climate Action had announced that they were going to start a campaign against cathedrals. Any cathedral that had investments or accounts with Barclays Bank, they would target because Barclays Bank is uh, supports the petrochemical industry. Well, this past week, there was uh, a choral service being broadcast by, uh, I believe, BBC Three um, music service from Chichester Cathedral. And in the middle of the live broadcast, two Christian climate activists, one of whom was an 82-year-old female vicar, retired vicar, interrupted the service with banners and shouts and uh, speeches about how evil Chichester was because it supported uh, the, the destruction of the planet Earth. Now, of course, nothing happens to these people. No, no legal consequences. Um, now, the church could do something. Once upon a time, vergers were more than old men who uh, showed you to your seat. Vergers in the early church were basically the guards. Their sticks were used to beat off the pagans seeking to disrupt the services. The vergers could get with it and drive these people out and give them a few good whacks. But no, uh, because the courts uh, have declined to prosecute and the Crown Prosecution Service has declined to prosecute people who do this, this is a form of protest that uh, the, the British government uh, doesn't step on. Now churches are fair game and we see the first move against a cathedral and that was Chichester this past week. So on to the next story. Uh... About once every five years, in my email, either on Anglican TV or a Facebook Messenger, one of the uh, many viewers of Anglican Unscripted will forward me the current, uh, I don't know what it's called, but when a state church is no longer a state church, it's documents involved in that. Uh, and uh, I I'm getting these again. Uh, somebody says the Church of England should no longer be the state church of England. And there's this official documents. Disestablish. Why couldn't I think of that, George? <laughs> and so, disestablishment papers are, are flowing into my inbox, and it, the date of the latest one is December first. Yeah, a uh, uh, private so, member's bill was put into the House of Lords mm, to disestablish the Church of England, yeah. refuse, uh, sever the state connection. Now, as a Christian and a part of an active church. I don't really want to be part of a state church. I, I can see in the long run and through history that it, it just that that won't work. Okay. And history tells me that won't work. And you and I are going to talk about a story where a Church of Denmark church affairs officer says churches in Denmark may lo no longer refuse to have women priests. Yeah, Denmark the, uh... is a state church. Church of Denmark is, which is in full communion with the Church of England, and yeah. thereby the transitive property of logic is in full communion with the Episcopal Church and all the other Anglicans. Yeah. Uh, it has a state church, and about ten, about twenty odd years ago, when women priests were authorized by the Danish Church, um, the government created an exemption to preserve the, protect the conscience of those conservative congregations that would not hire a woman because they did not believe in the efficacy of women's orders, they said a church may decline to hire a person based on their gender. Now, this was challenged in court where a woman uh, cleric was uh, refused a job because she was a woman and the uh, unemployment and the, uh, equ uh, the uh, equities tribunal, they have a... Uh, an equity tribunal or something like that in Denmark said, oh, this is wrong. You can't discriminate against women for being a woman. And the government threw it out saying, no, we've given this exemption. 
Well, the new church minister in Denmark, and her name is Louise Schack Elholm. She's one of these attractive looking women in her mid forties who looks like some of these Midwest governors. So she's a politician on the make. She has stated that she is going to rescind the exception. And because it was a government mandate, she doesn't have to go through parliament. So now Church of Denmark congregations who no longer want a woman priest may not refuse that person a job offer if they're a woman. Now she said, you may refuse somebody for any other reason, theology and whatnot. And so what we have now is a good old Anglican solution of lawful lying. We don't want to hire you because you're a woman, but we're going to say because you've got your cross-eyed, our theology does not permit us to have cross-eyed or left-handed uh, uh, priests in our parish. So, However, we would hire a woman priest who does not believe in women orders. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I guess that would be right. <laughs> now why this is interesting is that this is the path we've seen taken in the anglican churches in the lutheran churches all the the liturgical churches that have gone through the process the episcopal church and others have gone over the past generation what had become became optional soon became mandatory and now we've reached the point where it is no longer mandatory that if you disagree I'm sorry, you're out. Yeah. Church of Sweden, its bishops will not ordain anybody who does not believe in the ordination of women. Same with the uh, Church of Denmark has announced they will not ordain anybody who does not believe in gay marriage. The Church, in, uh, I'm sorry, the Church of Norway will not ordain anyone who doesn't believe in gay marriage, as does the Church of Sweden. Same with the women's issue, and now Denmark is withdrawing its uh, conscience protections. We've seen this in the Episcopal Church. Um, conscience protections have been steadily withdrawn and we've seen this with the whole fiction of mutual flourishing in the church of england and so it's not a it's not this is not a theological peculiarity of any one group it's just basic human nature when the liberals take charge they do not give up their authority and work over time to fully consolidate it so there is no possibility of opposition there is no such thing as good disagreement in this worldview and now we're just seeing it play out in the church of denmark well there's in daba doesn't that work i heard in daba is big the, it's one of the thing in daba excuse my language kevin you can push the bleep mutton it's bullshit it, uh, this is that's acceptable this is this is racist pandering yeah. Ndaba is a process in South African custom where the elders of a tribe get together and talk things out till they're agreed. Yeah. Ndaba in the Anglican world, we take this South African term and, a, and how it's been used in politics in South Africa, basically to turn it into we're going to talk and talk and talk till one side just gets exhausted and we win by attrition. And uh, uh, Ndaba is the fraud word the used by uh, Anglicans these days. Uh, uh, this is uh, well. It, it's uh, a fraud word because the assumption in Adaba is that you just haven't heard my side of the story. If you heard what I had to say in my experiences as a a queer Christian or whatever, then you would agree with me because listen to my whole story. On the other hand, is the person listening who says. You are a person just so in need of the transformational love of Jesus Christ. Uh, I hear what you're saying, and I know what you need. You're telling me you need nothing. And that's not the Christian model. The Christian model is Kevin Coulson is a sinner. George Conger is a sinner. We all need to be repentant and live a transformed life. You know? See, one of the reasons why Indab is a fraud is that the culture from which it comes prides conformity and unanimity of yeah. spirit and thought so that when you enter into Indaba, you're agreeing to enter into a process where you're going to come to a common mind on something. So the African culture out of which Indaba rose was one where the elders would come to a common mind. And if you disagreed, I'm sorry, at the end of the day, if it was 99 
people plus you, what? Yeah. you went along with it. Or you left. Or, or or you left. You say you, you. I mean, it's tribal. You are part of this tribe, or you're not. Mm. So the the Western worldview of individualism doesn't work that way. So what we saw, say, at the Lambeth Conference in 98, was that the overwhelming consensus of bishops was one way, but then we had to have a group of people who put out a minority view statement. We ha And Africans don't understand Robert, I'm sorry, Africans don't Robert's usually rules. use Robert's rules of order. Yep. And what I've seen in these things like the Anglican Consultative Council, and Lambeth conferences and other goring uh, organizations is that Robert's rules of order are used only to the advantage of Western interest groups. And then Indaba is trotted out when the Africans want something. And but it's in this fake Indaba that where it's talked out till you get bored and you have to go back home. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, I feel strongly on this issue about this cultural appropriation of the liberals in London of something that has no bearing on the reality of this world. Boy, you nailed that one. And, and, and so let's let's go south of the border, uh, south of the equator, and talk a little bit about the uh, Diocese of Perth. The Archbishop of Perth has agreed and has taken upon themselves to ordain non celibate clergy something i thought would never happen based on the politics of the last year i heard promises were made i bet david old is really upset george ah oh, well david <laughs> old is uh flaming uh yeah. not that sort of flaming but no, uh, no, no. Uh, yeah. spiritually well, flaming. k goldsworthy who's the archbishop of perth mm -hmm. had a non had a partnered gay man non-celibate gay man coming up for ordination to the priesthood and he's living in a relationship with another man and there was an organized resistance um to this and a petition was put around where almost 15 percent of the active members of the diocese say you cannot do this because the anglican church of australia does not permit this well k goldsworthy over the objections of a good solid number in the con in the diocese of people and to get you know just to, you know hurting anglicans is like hurting chickens you know to get three of them to agree on anything is a real accomplishment but when you get this major number of people but she went ahead and did it anyway precipitating another constitutional crisis this one australia is fairly loose in its bonds in other words diocese are not under the thumb of a national church. And what this means is those who wish to be, quote, prophetic, can be prophetic with no consequence to them, really. And, you know, so the conservatives in Australia have two options. They can wait till a dark night and see Kay Goldsworthy in an alley. They can beat her up with clubs. Or they can basically say, we're not, in, we're not, uh, in communion with you or we're not uh, agreeable to uh, recognizing this person as a priest so he may be a priest for you but he's not for us and that's the path we went down with women priests and gay priests in the united states yeah so that there's no universality of orders a priest a catholic small c priest in the of the church of god is no longer a universal priest you can't move across parishes dioceses provinces anymore in anglicanism because orders are not reciprocal. And Kay Goldsworthy has started this crisis within Australia. <laughs> Just like, I know. Uh, he, we had hope, and I had a lot of hope for what was going to happen down there. It just hasn't panned out. And we'll have to see if there can be some type of response. But as you said, once liberals hit the leadership, they the, the claws go in and they don't let go and i, I, I will mention on the side i think there's now a seventh congregation of the diocese of the southern cross uh in uh, yeah. queensland and newcastle uh this uh the, the australian diocese of queensland uh i'm sorry brisbane newcastle um the one led by uh uh 
former Archbishop of, of Sydney. Uh, I'm sorry, I've just uh, drawn a blank. It's our age. Okay. You know what we did, guys? And this this for the audience. Our first five minutes today, we, we just talked about our ailments. Well, I went to the doctor for this, and I went to the doctor for that. Because, you know, we're getting old, George. I, I start like sound like an old Jewish mother. You know, my bowels just aren't regular anymore. But you guys don't need to know that. Let's move on to talk about some other news. We've talked uh, several times about the Save the Parish uh, movement within uh, the Church of England, where they're trying to consolidate and do something with the empty churches and uh, g just get the program back together so that if we have a church, we can at least serve the community. And we got some more information about what's going on in Cornwall. Cornwall is the extreme southwestern tip of uh, England, for those not familiar with the geography of the area. Mm -hmm. And its bishops in 2022 20, uh, put together a campaign to emulate the Diocese of Leicester and other English dioceses that are going through centralization. <clears throat> and the Save the Parish is a national organization, and the Cornwall, Save the Parish Cornwall, is the local expression of that. And they had a report that was distributed that Anglican Inc. was given a copy that claims that the, the bishops of Truro, the report was uh, called Don't Turn Off the Lights, Bishops. Uh, the, the bishops are seeking to amalgamate Cornwall's Cornwall is rural, and they're seeking to amalgamate all these parishes into minster-type parishes so that people whose families or may have gone to this local church that they walked to for 500 years, they've now got to drive a half hour down the road. And the bishops are trying to basically turn it into a clone of the Holy Trinity Brompton, an alpha diocese. Now, the motives may be good, but the way they're doing it is from top-down centralization. And they're telling people that they need this because they can't afford to have dozens of tiny little parishes. Well, the reality is, save the parish, Cornwall says, that we've got the money to do this. And now we're being forced into clusters where there's an oversight minister and, as they quote, removes clergy from day-to-day -day contact with their parishioners and creates a top-heavy bureaucracy. So instead of seeing your priest uh, whenever you want or on Sundays, he's down the road, he's got lay assistants, he's got this or that, or volunteers, and you don't really have a pastoral relationship anymore with the priest. Um, but they're adding more bureaucrats, uh, you know, women's officers, ecumenical officers, minority officers, so on and so forth. And so the, the, the fear is that uh, by closing all these parishes, you're not going to get them to move to the new parish. They're just going to stop going. Mm -hmm. There was an experiment in Liverpool, I believe it was, where it found that... Uh, what they tried to do was an absolute fiasco. People just don't want to leave their churches. I mean, the the thirty old ladies attending this, you know, their church and have gone and fought through hell and high water to keep it going and staying there, and now being told, "Tough, you got to get in a bus and go thirty minutes down the road to go to church." They're not going to go to church. I'm sorry, it's just not going to work. And especially, I'm going to tell you right now, they would go if it were a dynamic church and it really met their needs as Christians. Uh, we drive a whole hour to go to church because we go to a dynamic church in Tampa that's worth the drive. Uh, it, you know. Let me just read a little passage for the sure. summary from Save the Parish Corn. The diocese says in its summary, the plans have been driven by ideology not by economic necessity. Mm -hmm. People were told throughout most of the process that money was the issue. It's not. The diocese is not in financial crisis and it can afford, can afford to put more clergy into the field if it so wishes. So the desire is not to... The diocese has the money to deploy priests, but they would rather deploy administrators and bureaucrats and staffers and assistants to the bishops. Again, this centralization that is contrary uh, 
to the whole ethos of uh, the success of a church, in my sure. opinion. No, it, but I saw this back in 2005, back in the Diocese of Connecticut Episcopal. Uh, in full disclosure, I was, I was part of their IT support back then. This was before the war started. And I was surprised by all the different people that worked within the diocesan offices on Asylum Avenue. I'm like, what weird ministry do you head up? You know, it, just all these titles of all these peoples and all these different offices. And in reality, you probably could have run the whole organization with five to ten people. But it was just full of uh, bureaucrats, full of people who knew the right person, who got the job, who's spending the money that was tithed to the diocesan office. And that doesn't just exist in the Diocese of Connecticut. That exists in most dioceses. You got the money, we need to spend it. Mm-hmm. You know, so we'll have a ministry to the chickens of the farm, you know, and okay, you know, spending the money. And there, well, we could have a ministry where we bring more people into the church, but that's no, no, don't be silly, Kevin. Let's move on. We got a couple more stories well, here. Kevin, I, yep. I, Go ahead. I remember. 20 odd years ago, I wanted to plan a mission in Felsmere, Florida, which has a very large migrant workers population. Mm-hmm. And I went to ask for money from the diocese and the diocese had a building plan. And then, and I was told by the then canon of the ordinary, uh, we're planning churches next to these new, uh, gated communities that are rising okay. in Orlando and, uh, uh, Hispanic congregations, aren't self-supporting so they're way down on the list you know money drives a lot of these decision making not a call to share the good news of jesus christ yeah. that's a me that was oh, me i didn't sign. hit my mission in films <laughs> you did it. all right mozambique we have an update um with names that i can't pronounce so we will we will default to george on that but uh, this Sammy guy has been on our nerves for a while, and uh, let, let's talk a little bit about what's going on over in the politics of Mozambique. Mozambique had national elections with massive cheating, according to Human Rights Watch and other uh, NGOs, mm-hmm. where the uh, ruling uh, Frelimo, Free Limo, that's the acronym for their name, party, has been seeking to to move from office the opposition Renamo party. There was a 20 odd year civil war between the two and there was peace process that was really brokered by the former Bishop of uh, uh, Maputo, uh, Dennis Singalane. Well, the, the government is trying to impose a one party state through fixed elections. And the head of the elections commission is the Anglican Archbishop of Mozambique, Carlos Mitzine. And Carlos uh, has gone along with the government's plans to impose a one-party state. And he did so by abstaining on the vote to recognize the elections rather than... And so. Now, other Anglican bishop, archbishops in Africa have been symbols of democracy and reform. We all think of Desmond Tutu, for instance. Sure. Another great one, and probably someone who I think will be in the long run will be of more consequence than Desmond Tutu, was David Guattari of Kenya. In the 80s and 90s, when Guattari was archbishop, and I got to know him in his closing years uh, around the Lambeth Conference of 1998, Guattari fought against Kenya's government's plan to impose a one-party state. So Guattari became an outspoken advocate for participatory democracy. He didn't get involved in the nitty gritty of individual programs, but rather just that there must be freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom to for the people to express their political will. And there was where one bishop was murdered by the secret police. Guattari was uh, frequently accosted by uh, thugs because of his political stance. And the nine of the 11 bishops of Mozambique and Angola want their archbishop to do the same, and he won't. So they've said, you got to go. Well, here's then Anglican politics center in. Metzine is firmly in the Canterbury camp. 
He is somebody who will go to primates meetings, who will support the Archbishop of Canterbury, who will toe the line. And he's in danger of being kicked out. In fact, when nine of the 11 demand your removal, you're going to go. Yeah. Well, the Archbishop of Canterbury sent uh, his uh, uh, deputy for Anglican Communion Affairs, the former dean of Nairobi, Sammy Wyam. I want to say Wyamia, but it's not. Sammy W. Sammy Sammy W. W was sent down to try to basically smooth tempers and let it all, you know, work out. And they wouldn't see him. And so I'm told. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so it was a basically busted trip. And now we've reached the impasse. There was to be a meeting on November 30th, but uh, the archbishop brought armed guards to the meeting and... uh, the other bishop said, wait, 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 wait. You're bringing guys with machine guns and pistols to this uh, bishop's meeting. Uh, it's like bringing somebody with a shotgun to a vestry meeting. And I don't think I'm going to go to that vestry meeting. So well, we're well, at a bit well, of an impasse. Okay, yeah. So they want him to go, but they've not had the meeting to vote him out because there are hints that the government is basically going to say, Oh, we like this guy. Don't mess around. So hopefully Mozambique won't go down the Zimbabwe path that led to Nolbert Kanunga. Um, but yeah. so we're still at an impasse and uh, hopefully they'll find a way to work itself out. The Africans like to work out their difficulties behind closed doors. They don't like to tell Nothing public, wash, yeah. their, wash their dirty linen. Mm-hmm. And hopefully a way they'll find a way to preserve preserving face uh, to use a, an expression more akin to japan and other asian countries uh it's very important in african culture too right. so they're going to try to find a way to find face but have the church continue to be a a vibrant witness to god in a difficult situation last story here good news story Alexandria, not in Virginia, has new bishops, George. Yep. Uh, Sammy Shahata, the Archbishop of Alexandria. Uh, let me just say that Munir Nice now has grandchildren. He has already has grandchildren, but he has yeah. Episcopal grandchildren. Yes, yes. Bishop grandchildren. Yeah. Diocese of uh, uh, the province of Alexandria yep. has appointed three new bishops. Uh, Canon Martin Reeks Williams is the diocesan bishop of the Horn of Africa. uh, Jeremiah Mate is the bishop of Gambella, which is in Western Ethiopia. And Anthony Ball is the bishop of North Africa. So these suffragan positions have now been elevated to diocesan positions. Um, So that it is the, the church there in a very difficult part of the world. Ethiopia has been going through wars and civil strife ever since we were born. Canada. Yeah, well, I'd say four centuries. Come on. Yeah. Uh, the Horn of Africa, that's called Somalia and mm-hmm. Djibouti. That's not places that are. And uh, North Africa is uh, Algeria, Tunis, uh, Tunisia, Libya, um, and parts of Morocco. The church is growing sufficiently that they can now have bishops and not everything has to be done out of what was once Cairo. Yeah. And this all, this all, this growth can all be laid at the far, the foresight and the plans of Munir and Nice. He's done great. You know, it, it's amazing to watch because you think you need patience to plant churches over here in America or the Northeast to do anything in that region of the, of, of the world is just tremendous. And you just have to sit back and uh, there's so much prayer involved in planting these these dioceses over there, George. Yeah, Yeah, and there's one country whose name we will not mention that has a number of uh, Anglican Episcopal churches. We can't talk about Uh, it. We can't talk about it. And because the government officially says there are no churches here, Mm -hmm. but uh, they sort of close their eyes to it and... There are there is talk. I don't know how whether it's true or not. Of uh, basically having a secret bishop or vicar general for this mm-hmm. country and other countries so similarly situated. A few years, a year or two ago, we reported about the situation in uh, Korea. There is talk, 
and we've not confirmed it, nor do we want to confirm it, that there is a bishop for Koreans in, North, in China who is also the Anglican bishop of North Korea, Pyongyang. Um, how does how that possible? Also, now you're, you're giving too much information here. We, we need to, you know, let, let's back up. You didn't hear that last five minutes. Mm, just, mm, nothing. <laughs> well, and I think here's the sort of, okay, well, yeah. the joke of it all is that we've got these people that say, you're not an Anglican unless you have a representative at the Anglican Consultative Council. These secret bishops, uh, I guess they're not Anglican. It's, well, the, yeah, even though I, they preach the word of God, they teach the word of God, they live in areas of massive persecution mm -hmm. and face the danger of arrest. I guess they're not Anglican because they don't have a business card printed up that, or uh, an invitation to a, a do-nothing group. I think we're far enough into our ministry here at Anglican TV that if Anglican TV says you're an Anglican, you're an Anglican, George. That's how we're going to do it. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode... I have to look it up. Uh, 833. That's right. 833 of Anglican Unscripted.